Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the first workshop for JPEG Fake Media. Um, we are going to have a couple of hours uh, of, uh, of discussion during this workshop, which is online, uh, just uh, for um, a, a very, very quick introduction. We are going to have four uh, uh, speakers. Uh, we are estimating uh, the, the time uh, of each presentation to be about 20 minutes. Uh, 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 well, you know, uh, experience shows that, uh, that in 20 minutes, of course, a lot of things can be said, but it's never complete. So it's possible that some of the presentations leak a little bit beyond that. But then we have put at the very end of the uh, four presentations uh, a, a time, in fact, uh, more than half an hour, uh, 40 minutes, in order to uh, ask questions, discuss, etc. So what we propose is for the interest of time, we first go through all the four presentations. And then uh, one, once it is finished, the, uh, the, the floor will be open to questions. In the meantime, uh, you don't need to wait and remember your questions. Uh, please use the chat in order to do the, um, uh, the, the, the ask the questions. And uh, during the, the last uh, 40 minutes, if there are any chat-based questions, uh, we first start with the questions on the chat and then move uh, uh, to more live interactive questions and answers. So our plan is to finish uh, within two hours. Hopefully we will be able to do that. Now, um, I would like to um, uh, uh, start with the first uh, presentation, which is some sort of maybe background setting, uh, which is uh, uh, the JPEG Fake Media Initiative uh, uh, context and objective. Uh, this is uh, a, a actually a work by the uh, by the co-chairs, uh, Frederick Temerman and Deepayan Bomik, um, who are the uh, co-chairs of, the, of, uh, of this activity. And uh, it is also supported by Fernando Pereira, who is the uh, subgroup on requirements uh, in JPEG chair uh, under which auspices uh, uh, its auspices, this, uh, this activity is taking place, and uh, myself, I'm the convener of JPEG. Um, I would like to immediately start, next slide please, uh, by, by telling you why JPEG, right? Everybody knows JPEG for compression and things like that, so why suddenly JPEG is interested in this? Well, um, in our, uh, before answering to why, let's first see what is JPEG. JPEG, as everybody knows, is a, a joint uh, a group between ISO IEC on one hand and ITUT on the other hand. And uh, it um, basically, it's really at the lowest level of hierarchy in, in ISO. It's, uh, it's very uh, uh, similar to uh, MPEG, which is another group that is well known. Uh, we are, uh, uh, currently there are uh, six, um, um, ad hoc groups, seven actually ad hoc groups uh, that are uh, sub uh, working groups that are uh, wor doing different aspects of MPEG and there is one uh, working group that is doing JPEG and then there are a number of advisory group under SC29 which is the subcommittee at 29 that takes care of audiovisual representation. Um, um, so you know th this is this is really uh, where this activity we are hoping that will happen, but uh, it can also happen, of course, in some of the advisory groups or uh, or uh, for for other type of media. Probably also will continue and uh, extend in in, for instance, one of the working groups two to eight of SC twenty nine, or maybe even other uh, places in in the ISO IEC and ITT hierarchy. Um, let me just uh, tell you a little bit of the history of JPEG. Next slide, please. Um, you know, JPEG is known, of course, as I said, uh, for its uh, compression standard. It has quite a few. The most, uh, I would say, uh, widely used and uh, the one that is, uh, you know, its uh, claim to fame is the, the good old JPEG format. Uh, but since then, there have been quite a few other activities. Some of them are uh, finished, are being used, are being deployed. Some of them are in require uh, in uh, uh, deployment or in progress. 
um, in terms of standardization. Now, beside compression, we have another group of standards uh, that take care of really the glue and other aspects than compression. There is a standard called JPEG system that, uh, that takes care of a lot of metadata related and file format related issues um, and also applications uh, such as security. Uh, there is a, a standard called AIC, advanced image coding, which is mainly quality assessment and metrics and protocols. We have one that is on uh, on search and annotation of content, uh, especially in form of images. So, so JPEG is also and has a history of use in other things than just compression. And in fact, there are currently three exploration that are uh, that are ongoing. Uh, uh, one is on um, a use of uh, um, DNA as a storage format. We call it JPEG DNA. It's an exploration, so we don't know whether it will end up to become a standard or not. We are exploring that. Another one is a, a JPEG AI, which is use of uh, artificial intelligence in compression and how to actually come up with formats that make it easier for artificial intelligence systems to, 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 to use uh, visual information such as images. And uh, the, um, uh, this one actually is, is pretty uh, advanced now because it's been going on for over two years. And uh, it is actually becoming now a new work item. So this one we know will become a standard. And uh, of course, fake media. And fake media is, uh, is, is uh, one of the three exploration at this moment. And uh, we are exploring. And one of the reasons for this workshop is to, to find out what is, if anything, they needed to be standardized where JPEG can play a role. Next slide, please. Uh, so the main objective really of JPEG in all these standardization you should keep in mind is that JPEG is not a company. It doesn't uh, invent, uh, you know, uh, and does research in terms of development of technologies. It really calls for technologies. It understands what the needs are. It understands what the ecosystem is and it enables um, um, interoperability within uh, these, these ecosystems. Uh, so this is the case of everything I just mentioned, and it should be the case of uh, um, the um, uh, fake media activity if it ends up being a standardization activity. I, I'm gonna now leave the floor to, to um, Frederick. Yeah, and uh, still to answer that question, why is, is JPEG interested in, in the fake media or where do we think that it can, can, can play a role? Um, we believe it's interesting to have a look at some of the activities that JPEG has done um, in the past. And one of these uh, is uh, GPSEC, which is a framework uh, that was particularly, particularly developed uh, for JPEG 2000 almost uh, two uh, decades ago at this moment um, to add um, uh, security, security features to it. Um, and more recently, we have been working on, on a standard which is called JPEG Privacy and Security, and which takes some of these uh, concepts to, uh, to build a framework um, that is based on, on the JPEG systems architecture, which implies that this framework can be used uh, with all JPEG formats, so not just uh, one of them, like JPEG um, 2000. Um, and JPEG privacy and security provides features like uh, partial protection of images or associated metadata, uh, religion of interest of, of, uh, of an image, for example, or a specific set of metadata, like the location where an image was, uh, was taken or the particular device and, and, and so on. Um, and in addition to uh, protection, it also focuses on use cases related to um, authenticity checking. And in further elaboration uh, on, on that side, we've recently been working on an exploration on media blockchain, because this is a rather new technology uh, from which we think it can be very interesting for some specific applications like digital ride management, these integrity and authenticity uh, verification use cases that I've mentioned, uh, but in this case, without the need for a third party authority, you can do that in an, in an open uh, framework. 
and then also in uh, media distribution and uh, monetization. So this is a topic that we've been working on for, for quite a while. And, and also on this topic, we've organized four workshops uh, in the past on the JPEG website. You can actually find all of these uh, workshops back and also see the presentations that, uh, that were presented. Um, and at the end of this exploration, we ended up with a whole set of, of uh, use cases. Most of them can be divided in two groups related to uh, media consumption on the one side and distribution on the other side. Now, um, blockchain in itself, it's an en enabling technology and as I said, it can be used in all these different applications. And it's why we have decided to focus on, on one particular application in the first place, place uh, which is um, fake, uh, fake media. Now, the title fake media might be a little bit misleading because it's not only about fake uh, media and, and therefore I want to stress our definition of what we consider uh, to be in the scope of this me uh, fake media uh, work that we're doing. Um, and we define fake media as a result of any uh, image or video modification that changes content or context regardless of good or bad intentions. And that's very important to mention because fake media maybe have a bad connotation to it, uh, if you look at it at the first side, but it's really about the two sides of it. And, and here is another side to uh, visualize that. Um, we think it's very important to, to, to stress that um, we're really looking in use cases on both sides and also solutions to uh, both of these um, issues. And to illustrate in more detail what exactly are these, these use cases that we're uh, looking after, uh, we've made a small compilation of, um, of um, examples of use cases uh, to, uh, to illustrate the, the context. Um, and for the, the, the first one, they will focus more on this bad or not the fake news uh, cases. And then uh, the second half will focus more on, on, on the other side of the, the setting. Uh, and for this first use case, I'm going to uh, head back over to, to Rich. Yeah. So one of the couple of things that uh, really I would like to, to share with you is uh, uh, that first of all, images really bring a, a very interesting dimension in um, providing messages and intentions. Uh, everybody probably knows about the, the, the story of when O.J. Simpson was accused of um, uh, uh, committing a murder, um, that, uh, that depending on how, in fact, the, the, uh, his, his skin color was doctored uh, <laughs> uh, to darker or brighter, uh, you could actually send a different message. Uh, so um, um, images really are, um, uh, regardless whether they they are are fake or not, um, can can carry really very very important um, information and add dimensions. Have lots of hidden messages and hidden intention. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, this has been, of course, the case also um, for misinformation and disinformation. Right. Um, often, I, I'm sure that you've seen examples like this. Uh, lots of things are said, and many of them are not even true. But they, by by be, adding a picture or by showing some pictorial things, we 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 we, we give them some some more you know uh, credible and more believable uh, dimension. Uh, um, next slide, please. Um, and this is really nothing new. So it's not that uh, in the last ten years because deepfakes. Uh, more recently, and uh, and photoshops before that have been have been widely uh, popularized. It's because um, the, um, uh, the, this 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 need to manipulate sometimes for good, sometimes for uh, less good reasons, it has been always run. This is a famous story of the um, um, uh, the the portrait of Abraham Lincoln, which actually, by the way, is not his. In fact, there was a senator um, in, in a southern state that was, or a statement in southern state in the United States that, uh, that, that had a very, very presidential posture. And uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, 
the, the, the head of Abraham Lincoln, but put on the body of that person because it makes it uh, uh, very, um, very presidential, maybe, or more uh, of a statement next. And throughout the history, this has been done uh, elsewhere too. Uh, Stalin is known uh, when everybody fell off his uh, favor, they not only disappeared from the surface of the earth, but also in all the pictures uh, with whom, uh, so this is, this is one of them where even though this is extremely old, uh, still, you know, in painting was, was, uh, was, was, uh, was achieved uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with really, I would say physical means and scissors and, and blues, etc. Next is uh, the same. Uh, this one is, uh, is uh, not in, China, in, in Russia, but in, in China, uh, where uh, also the same type of things happen. So these are all very old pictures. This one is Mao Zedong on the right with some of his, uh, his bodies, but uh, you know, some of them went, fell out of favor and disappeared. Next. Here uh, we see a little bit uh, a similar situation. Nobody really knows, but you see a person on the right between Hitler, Adolf Hitler, and the lady who's this. Actually, this is Goebbels. So nobody knows why actually he was removed, but for some reason, uh, uh, Adolf Hitler or somebody who, who wanted to publish this didn't think that Goebbels was a good uh, uh, person to be put there, and uh, it was it was uh, it was removed. Next. Uh, this one is Mussolini, so you know uh, all the cream of the cream. Um, uh, uh, on the on the right, you have the original picture. On the left, uh, he has this heroic gesture, and he probably either him or somebody felt that having a, per, a, a helper uh, keeping the the horse was not a very 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 heroic thing. Uh, so he doesn't need to be to be helped. Uh, so the, the person was removed. Next. Uh, it doesn't always happen, you know, in, in despotic and, uh, and dictatorial places. Uh, this is an example of a candidate uh, for prime minister in Canada. The right, uh, on the right, you see the Queen uh, of England and her husband. Uh, on the left, uh, the husband has been removed in order to give a, a more intimate uh, relationship between the, the prime minister of Canada and the, and the Queen of England for publicity reasons uh, in, in elections, just to show that they were closer. Uh, for propaganda, this has been used a lot. Uh, this is a typical, uh, actually, picture that you see around. This is uh, the, um, the, uh, the victory of the, of the Soviet uh, over uh, Germany during Second World War. And they, in fact, uh, some of the soldiers were, were, were basically stealing, like they had several watches in their hands, etc., and they were removed uh, uh, in order to not to give the impression that uh, that they were doing, uh, you know, uh, burglary and uh, stealing and stuff like that. Next, and uh, so this this actually happens uh, really even in uh, democracies like the United States. This is a this is a picture of a hockey team uh, during, I believe, uh, Olympics uh, where. The head of um, four individuals there was replaced by the head of others. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why, but this is really what was, this is an official picture, which has been basically doctor. So we see these things actually are happening um, sometimes maybe for convenience, sometimes for other reasons, but they have been historically there. Next. Yeah, and of course, recently we have these, uh, these examples of, uh, of using AI, right? We are, we are more and more people are using AI for, for manipulation. Uh, this is an example of how you could actually, uh, basically, um, change uh, the, the the picture of uh, of somebody, and impersonate somebody else. For instance, in an ID uh, uh, picture. Next, and uh, here actually very interesting. MIT actually recently showed a, a deep fake video where uh, Nixon. Uh, written but never presented obviously um, uh, talk on in the event if the moon landing of Apollo 11 was not going to happen what would happen maybe could you please uh, run it Hello, Mary. Hey, it's ordained that the man who went to the moon to explore in peace 
will stay on the moon to rest. So you see, this looks looks really very realistic. Of course, everybody knows that uh, this didn't happen, and Apollo 11 uh, astronauts they came back to Earth safe and sound. But uh, well, you know, they, they imagine if if uh, something like that happens and this kind of announcement are made before even the fate of some astronauts are known, it can create a lot of you know uh, chaos. Next. And of course, you know, this is, uh, this again, historically, this has been in forensic um, the forgery of media and, uh, and documents has been always around. Uh, document forgery for IDs and passports, forging insurance fraud by, by changing pictures, uh, you know, of, of cars and uh, either exaggerating the accident or creating accident where it doesn't know your customer, um, uh, KYC applications where you can uh, uh, fake identity of a person or even impersonating a celebrity. In fact, there are even uh, needs for, for detecting, for instance, as you can see on the button, uh, whether a passport picture has been taken from the physical documents or from a display of the digital version of it because, you know, impostors or cheaters, uh, they, 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 they are not all always have access to the physical document, so they, uh, they they can actually. This could be one of the ways to know whether something has been really taken from a physical document or from a replica, digital replica of it. Next, yeah. So here I'm gonna again uh, leave back to um, to Frederick. Yeah. So most of the, the examples that we've seen so far, the focus on only the malicious cases, uh, so to call it. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of, of uh, cases for creative and, and, and positive uh, usages. Um, one area is, is enhancement uh, driven modification. Uh, uh, AI techniques are used to um, enhance the quality of, of an image. And, and uh, you see a few examples here, like on the, the top right, that's an artificially uh, colorized uh, image. On the bottom right, you see uh, a super resolution image, which is created from a low, low resolution uh, image. And using an AI algorithm, you can roll it up to a, to a high quality image. Um, and then on the left side, uh, you can see a similar example for uh, denoising. Um, and also on video, this, uh, this can be used. And we have an example here of an old video, you can see a screenshot of it on the right uh, side. It's, it's an old video of a, a train arriving in a station. There's a lot of noise. There's um, a lot of artifacts uh, in it, but somebody has uh, created a higher resolution and colored version of it uh, that I will show, uh, show now. And as you can see, it gives a whole new dimension to that same uh, same video. Uh, while it's still looking realistically, the quality of it is is much better than uh, than the original. Um, but there's other, uh, also other examples. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, deep fakes, and, and there again, we often have this negative connotation, but deep fakes, they're also useful, for example, for sp uh, special effects in, in movies, uh, for the security of uh, actors, for example. You can use uh, a fake that looks realistic uh, without having to take any risks on a, uh, with a human being. Um, also for uh, privacy reasons or cost reasons in, in the advertisement world, for, uh, for example, you can use uh, created, artificially generated uh, persons that do not exist. There is actually a website, this person does not exist.com, where you can go and every time you click on it, it will create an image of, of a person that does not exist. And uh, there again, they're also used on, on uh, for other cases, like for creating fake profiles on, on social media. but there's also good reasons why these uh, techniques can be can be useful. Um, 
Another very interesting um, example is uh, deep fake uh, therapy. And uh, I have a video of that. It's actually coming from a documentary which was um, um, created in, in the Netherlands. So the, the, the video is in Dutch. So sorry about, uh, about that, but it, it gives an impression. But what you will see is a speech actor with uh, impersonating the deceased daughter as a means of therapy for the, for the father. Uh, and if she smiles or if she says something, then that can be impersonated in in, in the deep fake uh, um, version of the deceased uh, daughter. On the laptop open club, then is that ook het beeld wat jij gaat zien? Oh ja. Dus je zult zien, doe je hem ook maar eens wijd open. Maar lach ook maar eens hoe lief dat is als jij lacht. <laughs> Daarom is het ook, denk ik, heel fijn als je regelmatig kunt lachen, want dat... So again, uh, we'll distribute the slides, the, the URL to the, the whole movie is, uh, is available. I'm not sure if there are subtitles in, in, uh, in English, but uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting example of, of how deepfakes can be used in a, in a positive uh, on the way. Um, then finally, uh, it, it's not always about uh, fakes. So um, we have uh, a video here of the president of uh, Gabon after he has been uh, hospitalized. And because of medical reasons, the video looks like it is a fake. Yeah, you will see that there's no rimples, there's not a lot of, of natural uh, movement, but that's actually because of his medical uh, condition. But because it looks fake, people thought it was fake. And that actually led to, to a coup in, uh, in, in, in Gabon. And this shows the importance of the ability to prove that something is, um, is authentic. Mes chers compagnons, Gabonais, Gabonais, avant toute chose, permettez-moi de vous adresser. It was his first public statement since falling ill, and he looked different. A neurologist told the Post his appearance appeared consistent with someone who had a stroke or a brain injury and even cosmetic procedures. He has a great deal of facial makeup and I think he probably had Botox um, because neither side of his face is moving. You don't see the wrinkles in his forehead and, the, and in most of the rest of the face. If you look at his eye, the distance between the upper lid and the lower lid is greater on the right than the left, and that's an indication of facial weakness. And finally, that right hand is quite puffy and quite consistent with non-use due to weakness or paralysis. So this is to show that it's not only about being fake or not, but it's also about knowing the, the context. And you can also have images which are perfectly authentic, but they're used in a different content and hence tell a fake story. Here is another example of, of images. They're perfectly authentic. They were, these were taken closely after the attacks in, in, in Brussels a few years ago. But it shows that by the way you frame a picture, by the way you take a picture, you can tell a different uh, story. And by linking uh, the, the, the picture with the, the actual uh, place and, and, and time and, and providing the ability to compare it with other um, data from that that uh, moment that you can also uh, provide the bigger uh, bigger picture the bigger context so these were a lot of examples and um, that, that that's to, to show what we, we intend to, to cover within this JP, uh, JPEG fake media initiative but what exactly is our aim and, and what are the objectives so first of, of all um, that's basically what we're doing now. We want to involve with stakeholders to better understand these applications and to gather as much of these use cases as possible uh, to, to, to draw the bigger uh, picture. And based on all of these uh, use cases, we have to identify key requirements and identify what is uh, open where are there still opportunities for uh, standardization. And the reason why we need these standards is as always, to achieve interoperability between uh, applications. Like detection of um, deep fakes, for example, itself is not within scope, uh, but these algorithms could use a standard to add annotations to images so that uh, it can be identified that 
um, they were um, of, that these are likely uh, manipulated. Um, so the, 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 the potential standard will likely focus mainly on, on metadata on, on the one hand to signal authenticity and to security and protection of that integrity uh, information on, um, on the other hand. So once again, just to make that clear, so this uh, detection is not in scope directly, but we do think that if at some point this will become a standard, this will be useful for these people working in this domain um, to provide the results, the outputs of their uh, algorithms in an interoperable way and to allow applications of others to, uh, to signal what they have uh, concluded. Looking at the requirements, uh, at this point, we see two main groups uh, of, of uh, requirements. Uh, first set related to uh, describing the modifications and the second set related to securely attaching these modifications to the, uh, the image content. Um, and with respect to description, uh, we're looking at uh, descriptions of is something generated, is something modified, is something uh, captured natively by a camera. Uh, if it has been modified, what's the type of the modification? What's the purpose of the modification? If you use an algorithm for detection, what's the likelihood of a modification? Where in the image is, an Im uh, is a modification detected? What's the provenance information? What's the origin? And so on. So these are all the, the, the type of things that you need to be able to describe in, in a standardized way. And then secondly, you want to attach these um, descriptions in a secure way. Maybe you want to restrict the access to uh, just specific uh, individuals or specific applications. Um, and also this IPR information, this provenance information, you want to uh, attach that to an image in such a way that it's not trivial to, uh, to remove it again. We do realize that, that, that many of these requirements are not necessarily trivial technically to, to achieve. But at least it, it, it shows what, what, what people in, in, in the uh, community need. And then in the end, we'll, we'll see what can be achieved and what can, uh, cannot be achieved at this, um, this point. So that we'll see during the standardization roadmap. And therefore, I'm going to head back over to Twitch. Yeah. So you, I hope that uh, in order to wrap up, you, you see uh, what has been the funding so far in the JPEG uh, committee regarding fake media. Uh, of course, uh, we need now to uh, see how uh, uh, standardization can happen. Uh, the good news is that uh, we are used to this and we have actually a very nice way of doing this. It always starts with the activities like workshops that we see here to inform and engage, collect the use cases, uh, assess them, define requirements, and then decide whether we want to issue a call for proposal or not. And then once the call for proposal is issued, also there is a very well-defined also roadmap that follows that. Uh, next place. Um, so, you know, what are the next step for us right now in very short term is to continue collecting fake media use cases and then their requirements, survey relevant industry and government initiatives. There is not the first uh, uh, and the only um, uh, time that uh, people are paying attention to this. So uh, we have to look and learn from others, coordinate in, uh, get in line with other activities and initiatives that are going on, engage with stakeholders, attract them to contribute. And of course, one of the ways to do that is the workshop. So this is the first workshop. We are hoping there will be many more that will help us to, to do that. Now, what can you do really in order to contribution is obviously attending and thank you. You know, there are more than 40 participants to this workshop, which is fantastic. And thank you for taking time to do that. But uh, you could help even more. You could actually spread the word, encourage participation. Uh, if you are in this workshop, probably you have an interest and there are people you know who have an interest, please let them know about this. We need specially have things written. You know, um, they say anything uh, oral is a rumor. Any information that is oral is a rumor. So we have to write it down. So if you could help us to identify use cases, but also in a written way and to, to describe what they are in a more precise way. And then from their identified requirements, again, in a written way and a very precise way, these are the type of contribution that at this, uh, at this stage we are looking for. Next, please. 
Um, and thank you very much. We are really well behind the time that we thought it would take. Please, uh, uh, this slide is just for to let you know that uh, the key persons you can contact here, uh, you know, are are the co-chairs of the of the ATO group on fake media. So Frederick, who presented, Dipayan, who is actually listening, uh, Fernando Pereira, who is basically the, the the person in charge of of this uh, of the standardization activities. Uh, this is how it starts actually through requirements. And myself, I'm also at your disposition. Please, if you have an interest and you want to follow that, don't forget to subscribe uh, to the um, to the mailing list. And uh, there are quite a few documents that you can find already that uh, summarizes or even goes in some, in some aspect more into details of some of the things that have been done so far that is available on JPEG uh, website. And I would like to uh, thank and uh, finish here. Back to you, Frederick. Yeah, so that was uh, our first presentation. Uh, for the second presentation, uh, we uh, welcome uh, Fred Trajan. Uh, Fred Trajan is a professor at the KU Leuven in Belgium, uh, and he's also president of uh, Photo Consortium. And actually, it's not the first time that he uh, presents during a JPEG workshop. Uh, he also presented uh, during one of the workshops that we organized uh, when we were working on privacy and security quite some time ago. I don't remember the exact uh, year. Uh, and this time, his presentation is entitled Authenticity, Integrity, Context, uh, the Deeper Ramifications of the Fake Media Debate. So, Fred, up to you. So hello, I will uh, share uh, my screen. Uh, if uh, you can, wait, I can try again. Yes, indeed. Um, so um, part of what I will say uh, 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 relates very closely to what, what the virtual already uh, uh, showed in the examples. So I come from Photo Consortium and Photo Consortium uh, uh, is an association of photo agencies and photo archives together with uh, imaging experts, uh, uh, metadata experts, uh, and people uh, like me who are interested in uh, uh, digital transformation workflows. And so what I want to discuss is uh, some issues with disinformation eh, through the use of images, but we saw already a, a, a long list of examples uh, by Turich. And, uh, and I will then uh, discuss um, the issue for specific sectors. And um, I will end with a few uh, uh, hints on how this uh, impacts uh, in, in our view the requirements of metadata management of images and uh, suggest some mitigation strategy. So now, one mitigation strategy is closely linked to the activities of the GPEG working group, uh, of course. So what are the, the uh, societal issues? Uh, well, as, as uh, Turec correctly said, images are very compelling because they always inescapably, and research supports this, inescapably create an illusion of direct evidence. People are always in the impression that they are seeing something real. So it gives an enormous credibility to a statement when there is an image. And of course, this opens the door to a lot of manipulations. Uh, and we saw a lot of tampering of images, but the most common uh, misuse of images is that you decontextualize an image, that you use an image that in fact came from elsewhere. And that due to the fact that images certainly online circulate only loosely connected to the contextual environment, the only link is often the fact that they are embedded in the same HTML page. That's the only thing that really links the image to the rest. Uh, and this allows for uh, false recontextualization of images. Then, of course, there are the many uh, uh, examples of temperate images. Eh? Uh, there are uh, fake images of different uh, 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 levels, but we saw examples of that. Uh, 
one of the disadvantages that make uh, this really a problem is the low cost of reproduction and the facility of distribution of these images. And that is mostly the, the problem today that uh, uh, we are living in an almost real time uh, economy on images. And in this real time communication, we do not have the time to scrutinize every image that uh, comes to our attention. And this means that there is a rapid spread of this misinformation and disinformation. Uh, add to that that source tracing is quite an ambitious goal if you want to do it on internet communications. And uh, you simply don't have the time to every time try to uh, uh, see whether an image is authentic or is uh, has an integrity. Uh, think about the famous uh, Im the, the infamous image of Prince Andrew. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there are a lot of doubts about this photo, but no one has the time, the possibility to really uh, delve into the image to try to find the source, etc., etc. And then there is another uh, problem. So the, the, the advantage of the internet, eh, low cost and, 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 and uh, low cost of copy becomes a problem. And the second problem is the illusion of synchronicity on the web. Web users have the impression that everything that is on their screen is real time and is synchronous. And uh, this means that this gives you a starry, what I call a starry sky uh, uh, confusion. Namely, when we look in the night at the sky, we see galaxies that are, we see light that is light years apart. And we see it as one sky. But we see, in fact, a whole history unraveling before our eyes, which is as a synchronous experience. And this is really the issue on the internet that just juxtaposing documents, images that come from different sources, but also different timings, uh, give a bad contextualization. And I will discuss a few examples. Uh, one story of 1997, one of my first digital projects where we had a very strange experience uh, and a few other uh, uh, examples that I will mention. And then the few of these examples that have been mentioned uh, already in some way, uh, like the military guards, you saw the, in, the, the representation in, in uh, what uh, Frederick was showing. And then, of course, uh, so there is the, the frame dependent uh, aspect of photo evidence eh, and the influence of perspective that you need to take into account. And then there is the whole problem of AI techniques that are now used in photography a lot for color colorization. We saw also some examples of that. Uh, but this colorization, uh, due to the way these algorithms are trained, offer have, often have a bias. Uh, here, the example that uh, was one of my first digital projects was a CD-ROM on medieval history for secondary school use. And it discussed the Chronique de Henault, where uh, Jean Vauquelin offers his book to Philip the Good. Now we scanned an image from a school book. It was this image. And now I, I took the copy from the KBR. Uh, at that time, I wasn't able to retrieve an original photo from the KBR or from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So uh, we had to rely on the prints in the school books and we scanned it. And you see that Philip the Good has a black dress. The image that you can find today on Wikipedia also has this black costume. Now, we were producing this uh, CD-ROM and the historian wrote a story about the symbolism, the symbolism of the black dress, why it was black. It was a whole chapter in this CD-ROM for secondary school kids. 
I ordered an ectachrome from Bibliothèque de France because KBR couldn't deliver. I, I found a, another copy in Bibliothèque de France. And they sent me the ectachrome dia six months late. So the CD-ROM was already on the market. And we then saw this image. And if you look carefully, you will see that because this representation is also not the ectachrome, on the ectachrome, the costume was not black at all. It was clearly brown. It was a, a brown uh, filled uh, uh, cloth. So the whole story about the symbolism of the black was rubbish, historically rubbish. Now, our problem was that I couldn't rely on the ectachrome either, because as you all JPEG specialists know, and maybe if you have a photography background, ectachrome is also not a very reliable source for colors. It had, a, it had also a bias. And the image from KBR, which is now uh, digitized at uh, full standard, seems to suggest that it might be black after, after all. So that our scare that we had was not justified. Just to sh show you that the, the immense problems to do history research on the basis of digitized images, you need to see the, the original to be sure about that. And of course, on the internet, a very famous example is the yellow milkmaid, eh, where most of the images that you find online of the milkmaid don't have the right colors. Not only the colors, eh, there are also a lot of deformations. If I just search for Mona Lisa on Google, I'm not sure what the original even would look like. Hmm? Uh, it's, uh, uh, you see here, it is skewed. There is another expression in the face. There is another contrast. It is really an issue. Then we have the examples that uh, Turac already uh, discussed about. Uh, uh, the falling soldier where we have staging. Hmm? So again, this is not a manipulated photo. This is a staged photograph. Eh? Uh, uh, there was a whole discussion whether Robert Kappa actually captured the moment that uh, a soldier fell. Most analysts today think that it was a reenactment. Hmm? Uh, so nothing wrong with the digital image, it's just a, a, a reenactment. Here we have a composition, uh, we discussed about this in uh, then we have this problem of colorization through algorithms. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, in, in history journals, and that is why I wanted to mention it here. Uh, these these, these uh, techniques are heavily discussed at this moment. There are many publications where historians say, listen, there is a problem with colorization of uh, uh, film reels and, and photographs in the sense that most of these deep learning algorithms are trained with today's images. And today's colors are different than the colors of the past. For example, a blue jeans today has another blue pigment than the, blue, uh, than, than the, the older uh, uh, work attires uh, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So if you train the algorithm with uh, large quantities of today's images online, you will get an history bias of these uh, colors, uh, which is difficult to correct because you do not have information in the photograph to correct this. And one of the, uh, the, the possibilities is to help to, to um, to get people on board to uh, try to uh, uh, vet and, and va validate uh, colorizations. But then again, we do not have this knowledge of, an, of historical uh, colors of clothing, of uh, paint, of uh, uh, etc. And for example, the very specific Havana colors that you have in American 50s cars most of these colors are influenced by the printing technique of the moment in the 50s, the magazine, the early color print, and the technicolor film. 
So our whole perception of what the true colors were, hmm, unless you go to, to a museum, but carved paints also fade over time. Hmm, so we are not really sure about all these uh, colors. Another example is scientific uh, publishing. I think most of you know of this, uh, that uh, more and more we see that digital images are used in scientific publications as part of the proof, part of the demonstration. Uh, there is this example of stem cell research where, where the results of the, 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 the cultivation are photographed and are part of the, of the evidence. And there is a lot of discussion about possible tampering with this evidence. There were some high profile uh, withdrawals of papers, also papers published in, in very reputed uh, journals. And this means that when you move from illustrative use of images, which are often in JPEG format, if you go from illustrative use to evidential use in scientific proof, you need a better in integration of the data collection in your scientific lab, eh, in, your, in your procedures. And to my knowledge, uh, not many labs have a very solid photography evidence workflow. Hmm? They just take photographs. Hmm? These photographs are stored in separate uh, folder systems or databases and are then copied and pasted in the, uh, in the journal. Hmm? There is no, to my knowledge, there are not many examples of uh, research groups who have integrated databases that really link the date of the capture of the photo, the storage of the photo with the experimental data hmm? in one database system and certainly not with the publication data. So some groups are now integrating their database systems to allow for this. And I think this will become more and more necessary. And so evidential use puts new requirements, both in history as here in scientific publishing. And the last and a very different situation that I wanted to discuss is because many of our partners in photo consortium are photo agencies who deliver photos to newsrooms and they say, yeah, we'd rather have that a newsroom gets the image from us or for, from trusted agencies, of course, than from social media. Uh, because more and more we see, uh, if I look, for example, to the, the leading uh, 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 newspapers in Belgium, the amount of evidence that they get from social media is growing by the week. Uh, so more and more an article in, in reputed journals is stuffed with user contributed images that essentially come from social media. These news outlets are under extreme time pressure. And that is the, that is the, the poisonous cocktail because they do not have the time to vet these images and to see whether they are trustworthy. So even if you in your work can find better uh, file formats, etc., there's there will still be this problem of time pressure, making sure that people will not uh, be using uh, uh, and uh, for example, an, an easy, a very easy uh, 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 manipulation was uh, showing police repression photos from another event. Uh, it happened during these Catalan demonstrations. Now, this shouldn't dis discredit the claim that there was police violence because there were other reliable sources claiming the same. But some of the images that circulated even in high profile media were from other demonstrations in another time and other settings. Mm -hmm. um, so what is for me the impact on data uh, uh, management? I think there is certainly a growing need and GPEG is really uh, leading the way in thinking about this to protect 
uh, the data in the image eh, to protect the image integrity and its linkage to the uh, to the EXIF metadata, the, the XMP metadata, etc., uh, where you could uh, think about uh, fingerprinting technolo technologies, tattooage technologies to embed and to protect these and to uh, new GPEG standards to better protect these uh, metadata. Uh, but then again, it's not sufficient that these metadata are buried safely in the document. You need to communicate with the image database systems that are used in the new films, that are used in scientific publishing, that are used in library archives, so that we know and that we can retrieve this information as an end user. It seems if we can solve a lot by putting it in a tattooage somewhere hidden in the image, but we need the verification tools also for the end user. And so I can imagine that when we think about deep fakes, that in, in, in a year or two, three newsrooms will be crying for software to detect deep fakes. Because the journalist has to make a split second decision whether he trusts an image, yes or no. And we saw the very good example of what can happen with, with the, uh, the, 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 the health uh, and the the perceived uh, fakeness of this uh, uh, residential address. So we need also a better control of the, on the whole digital management of images. So not only the image file formats, but the databases they are uh, circulated and, and uh, managed in. So besides robust file formats, there need to be better integrated digital workflows. And uh, I'm really convinced that the pressure will be high, that it is not just, okay, there is a marginal use of these things. Uh, I think the pressure is, is really... And this means also that uh, the only answer will again be in more artificial intelligence because manual, manually checking all this will simply be impossible to do in time. Um, and this means that in my uh, honest opinion, we need uh, the, the underlying information systems that integrate everything that happens with the image from the capture to the publishing. And uh, certainly, I would say, in the world of scientific evidence, uh, we would need that kind of integration. OK, that was what I wanted to contribute. Um, I hope we are uh, back a little bit in the time scheme. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Indeed, you were perfect in terms of timing, but also, even more importantly, the content. You, you really opened up a few very, very interesting topics uh, uh, that, uh, that I personally was not aware of. And I think that it's very important to keep in mind uh, when, when standardizing. Um, I, uh, I, for those of you who were not here, uh, uh, Fred is gonna be sticking around. So I, I deferred the questions to the end of the, of the session. Uh, please don't hesitate to, if uh, you can now, put your question in the chat window. We start with our questions that are in the chat window. And without any further transition, I would like to uh, uh, um, uh, 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 defer to the third speaker. Actually, uh, he doesn't need really any introduction. And Nasir Memon, uh, he is, uh, I call him the Pope of uh, image forensics. And I believe that a lot of people agree. Uh, Nasser is a good friend of JPEG. He's been involved, in fact, off and on and off to JPEG, various JPEG activities, especially around security and blockchain more recently, of which this is a follow-up. And uh, he has been uh, very kind enough to, to accept to, to give us an overview of, uh, of, of some of the issues from technical uh, point of view. Uh, but also otherwise probably that we have to be careful uh, about. So the floor is yours, uh, Nasir. Uh, just that your, your, uh, your microphone, I think, is off. Yeah, you have to. 
Hi, Taraj. Hi. So are there questions or you want me to go, Taraj? Yeah, just go ahead. Uh, you can, you can okay. start. Should I, I can share my screen, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Oh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint, where is it? No, not that one. So we see your PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, you can see it? Uh, yes, but we are somewhere in the middle. You Don't can't see what? We, we see PowerPoint uh, slide number two, is that correct? Really? Is that two, one? Two. Oh, I, I, I put up Acrobat DC, sorry. My screen is showing, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll play, I was on the wrong screen myself. Uh, yeah, now you see it? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, I, I guess uh, the context for the issue at hand was said very nicely by the previous two speakers. So I will not uh, repeat any of that, uh, the context anymore, right? Understanding uh, that you know what the problem is. And I'll talk some of one approach that we've been taking, we've been exploring uh, along with a colleague of mine, uh, Pavel, and I'll talk about this. So, if you look at the context and the problems, right, where, what kind of solutions do we need? I mean, uh, it was earlier mentioned that detection is out of scope for JPEG, JPEG makes sense, right? Uh, that's not what JPEG does. Uh, but, but even then, uh, even if, if you want to talk about detection a bit, we feel that the media forensics kind of approach is kind of a cat and mouse game. Uh, it really doesn't lead too far down the road, right? It, uh, uh, it's it's limited in its applicability because the attackers always uh, get the upper hand eventually, uh, and it's a vicious cycle that you get into. Uh, but there's certain applications where ensure uh, integrity assurance is extremely important, and you cannot rely on the uh, attacker not being able to circumvent your detection. Uh, to, uh, uh, so instead, we need more solid guarantees, and and we think that hardware and software sort of support is needed in order to do these do these things. And that's where JPEG comes in. And for example, one of the really wonderful example, and I'm really looking forward to hear the talk uh, later on by Leonard about uh, the Adobe's content authenticity initiative is one such example of what can be done and should be done in my opinion. Uh, but we are looking at uh, something slightly different, uh, different, quite a bit different actually. Uh, which can also have its own place. So we're looking at, can we develop some hardware-based uh, or software-based proactive solutions, right? Like what we do uh, with, with a hundred dollar bill. I mean, we don't just make a pretty bill and hope that people won't be able to counterfeit it. We put some elements in it. We put some so integrity mechanisms in it that, that make it make it hard to counterfeit a forge and all those things, right? So something, things like that may need to be done with images, not with every image, not a picture of me with my grandson, right? That's not important, but uh, Images from video cameras, uh, images, uh, body cameras, law enforcement, uh, journalists, and things of that sort. Uh, we need some mechanisms that provide better guarantees of authenticity. And JPEG, I think, is the ideal organization which can help facilitate that, right? So, so if you look at historically what's been happening in, in, the, in the detection world, right? We had some sort of a sense of what the camera pipeline looked like and, and there are various stages in that camera pipeline and each stage leaves some sort of an artifact, some sort of uh, telltale signs uh, that are, will be perturbed or whose statistics will be disturbed uh, when you either uh, manipulate an image or those statistics will be different if for a generated image, right? The deep fake like stuff. Uh, which will allow us to sort of say something about the authenticity, right? And one of the famous ones is this uh, most successful one has been this PR new noise, right? Every camera has a unique noise pattern. And not only does, does that allow you to do uh, device identification, but also allows you to do uh, tampering as well. But the problem with 
PR anew, it has no security. I mean, I can, given a few images, I can extract the PR anew and I can put it in wherever I want to. I can tamper and then put back the PR anew, right? So, although it's been kind of robust and interesting, uh, but, uh, but it has limited applicability. So, PR anew, in addition to content attribution, can also like pinpoint regions of the images that can be transferred, right? But it, so there, but there are problems with it. It has like just no security, no integrity assurance at all, right? Uh, and so what we think is that the, the, the sort of the amazing progress that's being made by computational photography, and all of you know much more about this than I do, right? So I won't get into that, but basically the, all that stuff that's being done, uh, First of all, they will break PR new completely. They'll break the old forensics models completely uh, because the statistical traces that we are relying upon will not be there even just coming out of the camera, right? The, the moment the picture goes out of the camera, goes through the pipeline, imaging pipeline, it's already kind of quite a bit processed, right? So, uh, and for forensic traces will be hard to get. And so what we think is that one approach could be so, okay, uh, if we have now the ability to create really high quality images by messing with things inside the camera, by using neural models inside the camera, right? To take the raw image and produce the final image. Perhaps we have an opportunity then to take those models and put in some integrity mechanisms in it, right? Uh, allow that, uh, some integrity mechanisms in it. So I'll, I'll show you by, by example. Right, but but uh, just to play around with this con concept, uh, we've created an open source toolbox, right? Uh, where essentially you have the camera and it's a sensor, right? And then there is an imaging pipeline, right? The ISP is there, right? Which produces the final image, right? And that final image uh, can then be either manipulated or may not be manipulated. It goes through uh, platforms which do compression, resizing, enhancement, et cetera. And then you come up with something and you don't know, hey, is this real? Is it uh, tampered? Is it generated or what's going on? And then uh, we do forensics analysis and we uh, try to, and we've seen two decades of research in this forensics analysis, uh, which then tries to say, hey, is this real or right? So, so our thinking is that if this ISP uh, is being uh, now optimized to give better quality, can we optimize it for other purposes as well, for authenticity as well, right? And we showed that, yeah, it can be done, right? So one simple experiment, and, and you, all of you can play around it by downloading this toolbox that we have and play around with different parts of it to see how we can optimize that image produced in order to serve some purpose, right? So for the first thing we did just to play around with it is saying, okay, can we optimize that ISP which takes the raw image and produces the final image, right? High quality final image, like a black box inside the camera, right? And that's not the case today, but things are headed in that direction. Uh, and, and then optimize it in a joint fashion so that you get very good forensics detectability. So the image that comes out in some sense is forensic friendly. Not only is it high quality, but it's forensic friendly and, and it responds to forensics analysis better than uh, without doing this optimization, right? Joint optimization that we do. And that can be done without any sort of price on uh, quality is that what we showed. Uh, there's a CVPR paper which uh, actually was chosen as the top 1% for finalists, right? Uh, and you can look at it. That was about a year back or so uh, to get more details on that. The next thing we did, which may be more interesting in the JPEG contest, we said, what about the codec itself, right? So even codecs are now being kind of essentially being captured as models, right? You have a neural model, raw image goes in, a compressed image comes out, right? And, and, and they, we've seen some phenomenal progress in uh, image compression using uh, uh, neural models, right? And um, so, but can we, instead of simply focusing on quality and bitrate, uh, can we create com uh, codecs, right? Compression schemes that are forensics friendly. So I take an image, I compress it, and the result, the uncompressed image is better amenable to forensics analysis than uh, if I had not optimized it for, for that purpose, right? So again, we show that uh, like uh, one can create compression codecs that actually respond to forensics analysis much better, right? As opposed to 
without any optimization of that kind. Again, I'm not getting into details. We're already way behind of time and hopefully I'll catch up because I'm eager to hear the content authenticity talk as well. <laughs> Uh, so, so this can be done. We've shown that and, and there was a ICLR paper somewhere here, right? ICLR paper this year, uh, where we sort of presented uh, this work. Uh, but another thing, if we take it to the next level, right? So, okay, so now we can mess with the imaging pipeline uh, or the compression codec and to make images uh, uh, more forensics friendly. Can we take the next step, right? Because the, the previous uh, solutions, in some sense, still have that cat and mouse aspect to it, right? You're producing things that are okay, maybe a forensic friendly, but the attacker knows about these things as well. So is there a cat and mouse game that you're beginning, right? In order to get a, a security with some guarantees, uh, typically you need some secret in it, right? You need cryptographic primitives involved because otherwise you don't get that. Uh, and otherwise you just get imper imp imp empirical uh, security. Even with cryptography, primitives, so you quite often get empirical security, but there are more guarantees there. Uh, so we looked at, okay, what about if we, at the time of capture itself, right, embed some fingerprint, just like that PRNU was there, that's why I brought it up, uh, embed a sensor fingerprint, right? So imagine this particular model, uh, you have, oops, ran away. So you have, so essentially you have the raw image, right? And, and then before, uh, that is captured and, and there is now an embedding, embedding, embedding model, right? What the embedding model does is takes a secret, right? Which is, why does it keep going? Oh, it went forward or backward. Uh, it takes a secret, I guess it's sensitive. Uh, maybe other aspects like time, location, etc., And based on that creates a secret fingerprint, right? Which is customized for the moment, for the place and maybe even the camera, maybe even the content, right? I'm simplifying, I'm not showing all that. Uh, and, and then and, uh, the model then creates a fingerprint, right? Which is embedded into the raw image. And then the raw image goes through your regular imaging pipeline. And again, this is a neural model as well, say. Uh, and then you get the final image. And this final image goes through a channel and that means it goes out into the world, right? And the world does things to it. We call it a channel, right? It may get compressed, whatever, or processed. Uh, and then you have now an image and you want to know, hey, is this authentic or not? Right, and and so you have now and say an authentication service, imagine, uh, which essentially has a detection model, and then it it based on the metadata, it gets the time, location, and things of that sort, and it has the key secret. It needs to know the secret that was used at the time of embedding. So the camera is a secret. It need it needs to know secret key in the camera, and based on that, it can authenticate an image. So it can say, yep, this image is uh, uh, authentic or not. Easier said than done, right? Uh, it's still a problem that I think we need to keep working on. We've made some progress, I believe, uh, but it's an interesting model. And, and it's a model that's been explored in the context of watermarking. I mean, many of this community, we have looked at watermarks for decades now and they kind of, they didn't work, uh, but I think they didn't work because the threat model there was a bit different. In the watermark, you were talking about removing it. Here, it's authentication. So removing it only makes it inauthentic. Right, so the only model, the threat model that we have to worry about is spoofing. If somebody is able to spoof and make something appear as authentic, that's our, that's what we are trying to defend against. And maybe that makes the problem a bit more tractable. Maybe, right, I'm not giving guarantees, but this is something that we should explore. Nevertheless, we showed that these computational fingerprints can be created. They are really uh, very robust uh, as compared to the PRNU, which was the best model, the best fingerprint that we had uh, so far, right? Which was given to us by nature, so-called, right? The camera sensors had that uh, noise print in it, uh, but we can actually create a very specific, well-designed uh, fingerprint. And that gives you uh, good performance, good quality. And then it's kind of, if you look in the Fourier domain, whereas the PRNU was a noise pattern, here there's some structure to it. And what the structure, the neural model is learning, we don't understand at this point, but just wanted to show you that there is some interesting structure. Same thing with the compression work and the same thing with the ISP work. Uh, the, the, the kind of artifacts that is embedded by the neural model in the image are, 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 are different than what we've seen in the past. But as I said, all this is uh, <clears throat> easier said than done. In, in, a, in, a, in a 
if one wants to deploy this, uh, one has to understand the threat model, right? What is it that attacker can do? So there are three different threat models that we're looking at. One is the naive attacker. All the attacker has is that <clears throat> image that came out of a secure camera, quote unquote, right? Uh, and it has properties in it that if get violated will make that image not, uh, not authentic. And the attacker doesn't know what these properties are because they were generated based on a secret key, right? So those were properties learned by the model. So uh, all the attacker has that image and somehow the attacker now has to tamper the image and put back those properties in, right? Uh, and maybe the attacker has many copies, right? But again, every copy will have a distinct same fingerprint. So it may not help that much, right? Because every copy will have different time and location input coming in. So the, the random, whatever we embed in it will be different. But let's assume, give that to the attacker. Then what can the attacker do? Uh, that's the, what I call a most practical threat model, right? But, but if one goes step, a step further and say, okay, the attacker is broken into the authentication service. Now the attacker has authenticated a white box or black, black box access, access to, to the system, right? Authentication system. Then what can the attacker do, right? The attacker is trying to deduce the secret key somehow, right? Uh, what can the attacker do in that case? Uh, because the attacker has access to this, to D, right? And because this can be done under a sort of a secure enclave or something like that. So we, we know how to protect keys at this point, but, but, the, but the model itself may be compromised. And the third level is that, well, the attacker has actually access to the model in the camera itself, right? The embedding model and the ISP knows all the details about it. Then what can the attacker do? So these are the three kinds of threat models we are exploring. Uh, we've shown that this kind of, we be able to defend against this, not a problem, right? Uh, we are able to defend against this reasonably well as well, and we are not able to defend against this at this point, right? Uh, and again, when I'm saying we are able to defend, I mean it very loosely. We've not published it uh, yet, uh, but this is where we stand. And I thought this might be an interesting thing to point out uh, to JPEG as perhaps these are kind of um, mechanisms that could be, I know JPEG doesn't prescribe specific techniques, but they can provide hooks or tools that will allow folks to then put in techniques of this, of this kind, right? So in fact, we have a very large camera vendor who's actually interested in creating and is talking to us and sort of seeing whether one can create these, what we call computational sensor fingerprints. Uh, you can turn on the mode and take the picture and the picture will have that sensor fingerprint which will then be kind of, can then be authenticated by a system of this kind, which is made available, right? So, uh, so that, let me uh, stop there. And I guess I'll, I'll hang on and listen to the next talk and questions will come later, right? After that, is that right, Taraj? Correct, so the question will be at the end, but there are actually already a question Talks for you. Uh, so you could have a look at the chat, but then at the end. Uh, we, we are going to address them. Yeah, so the conclusions, I think the results are prop promising with this computational sensor fingerprint. It gives better detection, lower quality degradation, better security properties. Of course, these are not mathematically proven things yet, but we have enough empirical evidence that they're reasonable, right? And, uh, and there's some flexibility in the system. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Taraj, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. I would like to defer now to Frederick. Yeah. Also, thank you to uh, Nazi from uh, from my side. Uh, looking forward to the discussion uh, later on. But first, we will listen to our last speaker for uh, for today, which is uh, Leonard Rosenthal from uh, Adobe, and uh, he will give us an introduction to the uh, Content Authenticity Initiative. So, uh, Leonard, it's up to you. Great. Thanks, Leonard. Right. Off. All right, so I want to just thank everyone for, for coming today. So again, my name is Leonard Rosenthal. I'm the architect for the uh, Content Authenticity Initiative that I want to introduce everyone to uh, today. So obviously, a lot of people have already shared uh, you know, where they're coming from. Uh, Ours is not a, a different place, of course. Uh, we've already talked about the lack of trust 
uh, as to what people are, are viewing online. Uh, we believe very strongly that uh, the reason that they can't trust uh, this material is that they don't have access to the provenance uh, of those assets that they see, uh, the images, the videos, uh, audio, et cetera. Uh, and so what we wanna do in the Content Authenticity Initiative is build back that trust uh, for users by attaching the attribution, the history, the provenance uh, of what happened throughout the life cycle of those assets. Um, and incorporating that information uh, directly into the asset, uh, as well as establishing connections back to other systems that can be used to add additional information or additional provenance to the system. So let me talk about why we've chosen attribution. And, and some of the folks already have given you some of the, the pieces to that. But the big reason for us uh, and the starting point was that it's not an arms race. Uh, deep fakes detection, as you've heard, and I'm sure many of you are aware of, um, is exactly that. Uh, first off, uh, no matter how, what we have today is simply not good enough. Uh, even the best detectors are maybe 70 to 80% at best. Uh, if you consider the millions of new assets that are uploaded to social media sites every day, being 80% um, correct is nowhere near uh, sufficient. Uh, even 99% correct is still going to leave hundreds of thousands of potential um, assets that will be incorrectly identified. Uh, and just one of those um, being incorrectly identified could be the one that causes the problem. Uh, and even if you, we could get to 99.99999%, again, somebody's gonna figure out how to beat it. Uh, it's just like copy protection was back in the 80s, for example. Uh, so it's not where we wanna be. The other thing is that deep fake detection is based on the concept that edits are bad. That if it's not the original, Therefore, you shouldn't trust it. It's fake. It's bad. And as, as, as Taraj and Frederick mentioned at the beginning of this session, that even though we call it fake media within this group, it doesn't mean that fake equals bad. Um, edits are good. Admittedly, Adobe has made um, you know, a big part of our reputation on our editing tools. Um, Photoshop, of course, in, in the case of images. So that's important. It's important to our, our users. Uh, and as, as Nasir and others have pointed out, cameras themselves now incorporate that. So even what's coming out of your device is not what necessarily was originally picked up by the sensor, because you could have all sorts of internal processing algorithms happening inside of the camera. So is that acceptable editing or not? And we believe, again, all edits are good. Um, they simply need to be recorded and you need to understand what took place. And so having all of that information about, oh, it was edited and here's what we did, then helps us to understand that, you know, how trustworthy or not um, a given asset is. Uh, so these all go together into attribution. Um, when we talk about attribution, uh, we talk about the W's uh, as well as the H. Um, who created it? Who processed it? Uh, who did anything with it? What was done? So we were just talking about that. Um, did you capture the image? Did you modify the image? Did you crop it? Did you change its compression algorithm? When did you do it? Um, you know, the time that something was operated on and not just things like you know, time of capture, but even time of creating this given version uh, of the asset becomes important as you think about perhaps the life cycle uh, of the asset in the process. Where, of course, the location becomes very important. Uh, you've seen of many examples, I'm sure, in your lives um, of, of, quote, fake news where somebody took a picture from country A and identified it as being from country B. Uh, obviously that's not what we wanna see. Uh, we wanna make sure that the correct locations are identified. 
Um, you know, and then potentially even why did you do it? Uh, and then how, what are the tools that you used to perform that operation? See, these are all pieces of the attribution system that we want to see incorporated uh, and potentially in many other things. So this is, of course, an open solution. If you haven't been to our website, it's a contentauthenticity.org. Uh, right now, we've published a white paper uh, that you can read. It goes into a little bit of technical detail, but really helps set the stage for why we've done this, a lot of the same use cases and ideas that we've been talking about here in JPEG Fake Media. Uh, there's, we've been working together, uh, the Content Authenticity Initiative and the JPEG Fake Media Group, really since the inceptions of both. Uh, and it's been great collaboration in the exchange of ideas and use cases and the like. So I point you here. Uh, so today we just have the white paper. Uh, we made an announcement last week that we are starting to open up membership into the CAI. Uh, so we are wanting to get more and more folks involved in the actual process of defining the standard, defining the experience, uh, working on implementations uh, and everything. So we're, your timing is great uh, for everyone. And again, I'll point you to our, our website uh, and how you can get involved. But this is an open solution. Uh, and not only are we working with our, as ourselves, but partnering with various international standards bodies. So here I am speaking on behalf of the ISO. Uh, we're also in collaboration with groups at the W3C, with ETSI, which is a European standards body and others. So this has to be done as an open solution. This has to be done as one or more open standards and in collaboration with existing open standards. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Adobe, uh, who I represent, of course, uh, is not the only partner. Uh, we're just one of a series. Uh, the initiative itself started with Adobe, the New York Times, and Twitter. We've since grown some of the companies that uh, are uh, identified here, TruePic and Qualcomm, I'll mention again in a second. Uh, news organizations like the BBC and the CBC. Um, and uh, NGOs and, and human rights organizations like Witness, uh, who have been a, a great uh, insight for us in really understanding how important this is to the folks who are out in the field, taking the photos, taking the videos of the atrocities going on and the needs that they um, bring to our set of requirements. And I'll talk a bit about those momentarily. But I did want to point out that, again, um, there are announcements coming out from our partners. If you missed it last week, uh, two of the partners in the initiative, uh, Qualcomm and TruePic, um, announced their uh, embedding of the CAI technology into the Snapdragon chip um, and demonstration of a, the first camera or you know, smartphone and, and camera um, that actually has this secure capture. Um, in it. And I'll actually show you at the end of, of my talk, some actual images that were taken with it and how you can go take a look um, at this yourselves. So really we're seeing this slow, you know, actually moving along uh, and real partner development uh, of this. So I wanted to just back up a little bit and I'll sort of get into the, the details. So that sort of sets the stage, I think. Um, you know, what were some of our goals in building this and how did we use some of these goals? Uh, what have we accomplished with them? So one of the first and, and remains one of our key goals is to not reinvent the wheel. Uh, we believe very strongly that uh, when there is a existing technology and especially one that is an open standard, we're going to adopt it and we're going to use it and integrate it into our solution. So our goal is not to invent new things. Our goal is to figure out how to take existing pieces and put them together into a new and novel uh, approach. Uh, and in doing so, we believe that this will ensure um, that there's not an unreasonable complexity or cost burden for implementers. So for example, you know, being able to put it in hardware, uh, as we just saw demonstrated, that was uh, very key. And we had to make some changes in our design to ensure that it could be implemented in hardware and in, in very you know, low power, uh, low complexity devices. 
So very, very important to our design. Uh, we do not require cloud storage. So uh, the system, it can be done entirely uh, in the asset and on device. Again, I'll, I'll use the Qualcomm TruePick example, but we are fully extensible to enable cloud storage uh, and cloud connectivity. It's part of the architecture and, and that's by design so that we can have the something totally self-contained and something that stores many, you know, most uh, potentially not all, but close to all of its information uh, in the cloud. Um, and therefore we can leverage and evolve as um, the world evolves, as we continue to connect our assets into cloud systems. Uh, we heard uh, Nasir, I believe earlier speaking about CMSs and content management systems and the need to connect uh, to those, absolutely. This is something that is very core to our design. We want to allow flexibility in the types of information that's stored. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that momentarily. Uh, there's, we think about this as a trail, uh, if you will, an audit trail, uh, the history, the provenance. Uh, and that means that this has to work across any tool that's involved in the creation, the editing, the publishing, the distribution of these assets. Uh, so it has to be, again, tool agnostic, concept agnostic. Uh, and in fact, I'll take that into my last bullet point, which is also asset type of agnostic. So we've designed a system that works. We've demonstrated it on images. Uh, we've demonstrated it on documents. Uh, of course, being Adobe, a PDF uh, is very important to us. So we've also been able to demonstrate that we can utilize the exact same technology inside of a PDF file. And we're also involved in, as an initiative, looking at video, video of course being one of our, our next priorities um, for involvement, but we're also looking at audio, we're looking at 3D, we're looking at AR and VR, any type of asset, any type of experience um, needs this type of authenticity, this attribution associated with it. And we believe we have a system that can address all of those various things. But we also know that we're going to need a lot of, of um, industry experts in each of those areas. Um, we will look to the video experts. We will look to the audio experts, et cetera, to help us ensure that we're addressing all of the needs of those various industries. Um, just briefly, some of the core technologies that we've leveraged. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. Uh, JSON, of course, XMP is our metadata standard. Uh, as the international standard for that. Uh, something we have uh, really appreciated from the JPEG community is JUMF, uh, the universal metadata box uh, has been a huge win for us. And then our cryptography is based on uh, standard CMS. And also in order to align with the European standards, uh, we are fully compliant with CADES, which is the European standard uh, or a European standard for digital signatures. So again, core technology stuff that's out of the box um, and can be put together um, with a lot of pre-existing open source technology. Uh, I just wanna mention some of the various types of things that we've already defined to be included in, uh, uh, that can be included in what we call a claim. Again, this is not the complete list and it is fully extensible uh, we are aligned with XMP, as you can see on the slide. We're aligned with schema.org. So we're and so all of these pre-existing metadata standards can all be incorporated accordingly. Uh, but some of the things, of course, I've mentioned locations, uh, identity is very important to us. Uh, but at the same time, we support anonymity and pseudonymity uh, because those two, as we mentioned in the context of some garden like witness becomes important. The uh, details of your camera and depth mapping uh, to ensure that there's more forensic data uh, that can be utilized. Uh, the one other thing I'll point out on this uh, slide that it, a lot of people tend to miss, but we actually have found is probably one of the most important is ingredients. Uh, and this is the idea that most 
images after they come off the capture device, uh, and this is true not only for images, but for other assets, are composed from many other pieces, uh, what we call ingredients. And so the idea of being able to understand all of the individual pieces that make up a new asset is extremely important to understanding its provenance, especially when each one of those themselves contains various elements of authenticity and, and, and provenance. So I don't wanna to go too deep into the picture, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what this might look like. Uh, obviously within an image, we would have the pixel data. In addition to the pixel data, there's what we call the CAI data. So this happens to be a jump block um, containing the individual assertions. That's what we call each of those types of things that I was just talking about. For example, the locations um, and the identity and the like, uh, the hashing that takes place over each of these individual items, the claimant itself and all the details of the complete claim that's being made and the digital signature that's applied over all of this material. And then that is directly connected into the XMP uh, of the asset. And of course, in this case, uh, and then it all goes together. Now, this example shows it all embedded in the asset, but as I mentioned, uh, some or all of this information could also be stored in a cloud um, or connected to a blockchain uh, or various other approaches that could be used. So it's, again, this just sort of gives you that overall idea of what we're trying to accomplish and the model we're using to accomplish it. So let me just take, I think I have a few minutes left. Um, this is a video, you may have seen it. I'm gonna skip through a little bit of it. Let's see how well this plays. Um, this shows you what this would look like uh, in Photoshop. So let me skip through the, the idea first. behind attribution. I'm going to skip through some of this. Let me say, there we go. Creative work and social media share. Andy likes to travel. He's going to imagine a trip to the Chocolate Mountains in the Philippines by adding a photo of himself to an Adobe stock image. Let's begin by opening the content authenticity panel. The panel is opt in. The creator, the Photoshop user, can decide to attach no data or selectively choose to include thumbnail authorship, which is produced by detailed edits and the assets used. For our first edit, we'll merge the two images. Then we'll use Photoshop magic to replace this. Just you guys don't need to see how Photoshop works. Let me scroll through here because what I want to do is get to this image. Here. It was produced with Adobe Photoshop and was cryptographically signed by Adobe, inclusive of additional metadata. AI assisted tools were used in its production, other assets were used, and there were changes and edits applied. We can choose not to include the before thumbnail now and can choose not to include Andy's identity. This is entirely opt in. We can turn things on and off per use case. For the moment, we'll leave all of the options toggled on and then we'll export. Okay, so now that you've sort of seen what that might look like at the author time, what I'd the like- The idea to behind attribution yeah. is that we're capturing- Okay. What I'd like to do is show you what it looks like on the other side. So if you go to, again, contentauthenticity.org, um, one of the things you can do, and I'm actually gonna take you to our website and show you this live. Um, because I want you to see that it really is something you can do yourself. So I'm here on uh, contentauthenticity.org slash case study. I am live on our website. You can do the exact same thing. Uh, play, you know, play along at home if you'd like. Um, this is a picture that was shot with that camera that I mentioned from uh, Qualcomm and TruePic. And what we'll see is we put a little badge over the image to identify that it has a content authenticity initiative data applied. So if I click on the little eyeball, we'll see exactly the same sort of thing you were just seeing in the video, which is here's the thumbnail of the image. This tells me that the photographer was Sarah Lukovitz. She produced it with Photoshop. Um, so obviously we can assume this was, was modified um, and when they, she did it. And we'll see that this, the, she applied a color and adjustment, some effects and styling, and some transformations. Uh, and then here's the original image, but I'd like to get a little bit more information. So I'm gonna click on view more. 
Uh, and this is going to take us out to what we call our verify site. So on the right, we see the information that uh, we were just looking at. But here we can see, here's the original. So I can actually click and see, here's what was there. Now, that was the image that was posted online. Here's what it looked like before she applied the infer, her modifications. And again, we can see that it was produced with the TruePick Foresight firmware for the Snapdragon. Um, and that was the capture operation and it was captured in New York. Uh, and just one of the other things I'll show just because I think it's kind of nice, neat as a way to wrap up is that um, we have this cute little UI where you can sort of take a look um, at the differences as you go along. So this is just a work in progress. Um, we're just trying to give folks really an idea of what this might look like uh, in the real world. Uh, and again, this is just sort of first steps. Uh, we're looking for lots and lots of uh, input to this. And we expect that that's going to be a big part of the standardization process is going to be understanding is all of the right information present? Uh, what else is necessary? What are the experiences that users are expecting? And especially that little eyeball, like we want something that users go to any site in the world, they see that something on an image, something on a video, and they know that that means it's authentic, uh, or has the authenticity initiative information present what will that look like? And we think that's also something that's going to be part of standardization. So let me say thank you again to everyone for the opportunity today. And let's go to Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, again, this was also, a, although we, we knew part of it because uh, Leonard is a, has been around and has been educating us uh, about, about CAI, a very, very nice uh, and new and refreshing uh, demos. demos. Uh, so yeah, so we are actually doing quite well, 15 minutes left before time. So we have uh, uh, plenty of time for questions. And uh, I see there are actually questions to uh, all three speakers uh, 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 today. Um, and uh, I, I would like to maybe leave the, because uh, some of them are, um, uh, uh, are, are maybe comments uh, rather than, than questions. Uh, so there is one to uh, Fred uh, from Sabrina. Sabrina, would you like to, to, to make the comment directly yourself or you want me to read it for you? Maybe it's better if you do it yourself. Hello, hello. I'm happy Hi. to, um, uh, well, everybody can read it. I'll just be a little bit more freeform about it all. Um, Fred, thank you very much for that fantastic presentation and so many new things that I hadn't seen before. And I was, uh, what I put in my comment was that I was really interested in the notion of interoperability of JPEGs with, uh, with uh, the workflows that um, are in place. In particular, I commented on news, but of course, science research and evidence is really critical as well. There is a, a real problem with um, image manipulation in scientific papers, not because people mean to do the wrong thing, but because they just do the wrong thing accidentally and creates some havoc there. Um, so it, mine was really more of a comment to just say that I think it's really important, especially in Australia, we're um, investigating digital platforms and how they're uh, reusing news that's being created by news uh, producers. And it, here in Australia, we're starting to have some governance around that saying that we need to have uh, Googles and Facebooks, et cetera, of the world paying for the news that they're using. And that means that this is an opportunity for us, for, our, for the JPEG uh, standardization that we're looking at to um, uh, be able to uh, cope with the fact that either Google is going to start creating news or independent news agencies are going to be able to reverse that problem that they're suffering from not being able to get uh, revenue and therefore uh, sustain their operations. Um, do you, uh, I guess, as I say, it's not so much a question and I apologize for that, but did you have any view on that, um, uh, that, uh, that yeah. phenomenon? I think that is indeed uh, a problem that is uh, uh, resonating quite strongly uh, among the members of Photo Consortium who are uh, photo agencies uh, often uh, acting as a source for uh, independent news outlets uh, to, to base their publications on. 
and their uh, worry about uh, the Googles and Facebook of this world is also very well known to the JPEG community, I think, that is that they strip the metadata from the photos so that uh, uh, these agencies cannot even uh, trace what is happening to their content. And uh, I think it is in everybody's interest that, uh, that the, the information integrity is conserved. And, that, uh, and, and uh, certainly in a business to business uh, uh, situation, uh, I can imagine that for Google, etc., they cannot implement such things for um, for images that are uploaded by by end users, uh, which is it's, it's already a difficulty. But certainly, in the in the um, the workflows in a business to business context, uh, and especially in in reporting and, and news, uh, this will become uh, very important. I I think we cannot. Um, we cannot continue the way it is now because the, the, the trust in images is eroding. Many of these news outlets are using uh, social media content uh, and then afterwards it, it, it appears to be of, of, of dubious uh, uh, um, uh, source. So yes, I, I believe strongly that it is not only the image format and there, there is a lot of work being done, eh? but indeed also mechanisms that, that uh, safeguard. Uh, and, uh, and there is a legal thing to it. Eh? Australia is taking action. I think that in Belgium, there, is also, there was also a legal initiative to try to force these uh, platforms to uh, implement trusted sourcing. And, and I think what we heard here from Adobe is very encouraging that they invest in that kind of technologies that will uh, be part, I think, of the game. And that is what publishers want. Uh, that is what editors want and certainly what researchers need. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Fred, there are, there are other questions for you, but uh, in order to really give a chance to uh, to all the questions that we raised, uh, I want to go one by one in the chronological order. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the next question actually is mine, so I'm going to skip it. But um, there is a follow-up question uh, for Nasser um, uh, by Antonio Pinero. Antonio, you, you are there, I think. Uh, maybe you want to ask the question directly. Antonio? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, hello to everybody. Yes. Yeah, so the comment, it was more than a comment that uh, uh, JPEG AI requirements include computer vision. So uh, forensic information should be included and uh, it is important to to keep in mind that uh, as a, a computer vision task, that we should keep the, these kind of requirements uh, related with the forensic uh, available. But I would like to hear comments on that. So Nasser, uh, the question is to you. Are you there, Nasser? Yes. Uh, so, so you know, uh, one mention, one thing that you mentioned in your presentation was that. In fact, the coding and the codec has an influence in, in this whole thing. Right. And uh, there are a number of, uh, you know, initiative currently in JPEG. One of them is JPEG AI, which is a neural network based compression. And uh, the question really is, uh, uh, do, you, uh, do, do you think it makes sense that any new coding scheme should have a requirement, uh, especially JPEG AI, that would, um, that would that would have um, uh, what you called uh, 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 authenticity friendliness uh, uh, also incorporated in it. Yeah, so I mean, uh, should is a strong word, but I think it should be considered, right? It's possibility, I would say, right? That uh, there's so many other things that sort of need to be. There's lots of trade-offs that JPEG has to sort of juggle with. How would you how would you do this? Like such a requirement, how do you assess it even? So assessing it is yeah because again it's it's a problem 
that's the problem with uh, these things, right? Because uh, you can assess it with certain standard set of manipulations, yeah. right? And combinations of them. Yeah. Uh, and, but that's not, that's not the universe of multiplication yeah. of manipulations, <laughs> right? So one can try and be uh, a bit more comprehensive, but uh, with the understanding it's not the universe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe we won't have the answer, but you mentioned yourself three models of, uh, you know, attack, I, right. I think. And, you know, one of them was some sort of a generative adversarial network. So even if, you know, you, you assess and you know how you assess, a GAN network could make sure that at least the ones that are, that are used in the assessment uh, to set up the standards right. are, are, are taken care of. No, I think I can, I can uh, yeah, so what they may do is they may say it's fake, right? So it may be easy to uh, perhaps uh, create uh, false negatives, right? By tampering it, right? But then you've tampered it in some sense, uh, but uh, it, I believe it's much more challenging to create false positives, right? Uh, it should be close to very impractical. That's what cryptography does, right? Close to impractical uh, to decrypt it, right? But you can always jumble up the message. Uh, so I think the threat model is that I'm not trying to take a real image and I mean, the real image is there and if I modify it, it'll of course be flagged as tampered. Uh, uh, if in that application, if that application makes sense, but but you cannot take a real image, uh, uh, tamper the image and then prove it as real, right? So you, you, that is what this may protect against. Now, maybe you need the other one as well in certain applications, then you need other techniques, right? So I don't think there's a single silver bullet. I mean, the content authenticate, authenticity initiative is a, a fantastic example, right? Of uh, what can be done. But again, uh, it doesn't capture the things that don't go through that system, right? Uh, so, or if I opt out saying I don't want it and I then tamper it. So, so I think the multiple things needed uh, and, and uh, uh, that, the thread model looked, I looked at covers one of them, right? Not, not all. And you're right that in security often and in forensics is, is always a multi-layer, right? Approach in security yeah. in general. You don't right. rely on one, only one lock or one, one shield right. because that shield can break. You need a few others, absolutely. Right. Okay, so let's, let's move to the, to the next uh, question. This one is for Leonard and from Sabrina. So Sabrina, you wanna go ahead with it? Hi, thank you very much, Leonard. That was really interesting. And I just wanna say before I say anything else, I just wanna let you know that I recently spoke at the Creative Commons Global Summit and I talked to them about your creative, uh, your content authenticity initiative. So. Okay. I, I thought you'd like to know there was press going on around it. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> uh, so the question I have is, I think that it's uh, that the identifying what the nomenclature is around edits in uh, a way that it's not just uh, understandable to technicians, but also to end users is a bit of a challenge. And also looking at it through different lenses, like um, how severe is this kind of an edit in terms of manipulating a photograph uh, I mean, one of the things that I found in looking at it is that um, uh, electron microscopists find removing red eye to be a heinous act, whereas for everybody else, it doesn't matter at all. So um, coming to a, a, a nomenclature that covers those kinds of concepts, is that something that you're talking about in your group? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. And the answer, the, the answer is yes, absolutely. We think that coming that that, uh, that coming up with that nomenclature and again, not just, it, and it will probably be segmented because the nomenclature, what we've already learned is the nomenclature for imaging is not the same as for video, is not the same as for documents, et cetera. Or worse, the same word is used and means completely different things. So what, what we started with and what you saw in the, in the examples that I showed we took the over 2000 verbs that are in Photoshop um, and we categorized them. So we 
So, and, and it's really a difference. There's, and I, and I should, we, we hide a bunch of this. So inside, we want to know all the gory details so that the forensic people can actually see every single little thing that was done. But we know that the average user will have no idea what that means and what to do with it. So instead, that's why if you look at the user interfaces I was showing, if you go to our sites, it says like AI assisted. Okay, that's enough for a user. Under the hood, it says neural filters, this filter, like the details. And so it's not only about how do we capture something that's understandable, but then how do we present that? Because they're not necessarily the same thing. And yeah, we, we have to do that as a community, as an industry. Okay, thank you, Leonard. Really impressive. A, a, a impressive approach. Sorry, Taraj. I just want to say that's an amazing approach that you've taken. That's a lot of work. Yes, indeed, it is. So, uh, Leonard, there are a few other questions. Uh, one is from me. It's very quick. Uh, you showed a very interesting video. You, because of interest of time, I think you had to go over them. Uh, is it possible you you share the URL of that video so that people can can watch it? I, I will, and in fact, I'll actually do one better. The PDF I'll distribute will have the video embedded Perfect. into it, so you can just watch it right out of the Excellent. PDF. So Perfect. totally, yes, that's planned indeed. And Perfect. maybe in addition to that, the demo that you showed on the website, is that some, something that uh, which, which is open to play with, or uh, do yeah. you need to log in for it? Okay. No, nope. no, nope. that's why but I showed it. You can, you can go there right now. Please, please go to contentauthenticity.org yeah. slash case study and have fun. Yeah. Oh, so there is another question uh, from Minky Hong. I don't know if he's here uh, still or she's here. Is uh, to Leonard. Yeah, I, I can answer the question. I don't know. Okay. If, if, if so the question right. everybody can read. Maybe you want to answer that. Yeah. So uh, the question is about using uh, CAI as an open standard. And the idea is. Uh, yeah, it's the whole point of it is being open and an open standard. And we also expect to have one or more open source implementations that go along with it. Um, those will accompany it. And the whole point is so that anybody and everybody can use it. There's no cost involved. You want to build a service around it. That would be great. Uh, you want to put it in hardware. That would be great. Yeah, th th there's no way that this, the whole idea um, will succeed without everybody being able to do it and without a barrier to entry. It's, it's just part and parcel of what we're trying to accomplish. And we, I think, and I'll say we in this case, even J this group itself, JPEG Fake Media, this whole idea, this whole concept has to be done open, has to be shareable, has to be anybody can do it or we won't work. It will just won't. Okay. Thank you for the clear answer and the good answer, by the way. Everybody is probably very happy to hear this. So maybe the last question from Michael uh, Steidel. I don't know to who it is addressed, uh, but uh, Michael, are you online? Yes, I am. Yeah, so maybe you wanna you wanna say also to whom you are asking the question. Yeah, well, actually, let's say to the JPEG fake news, fake news group okay. and all the involved. Uh, uh, so I'm from IPTC and we are the maker of a standard which is widely used uh, with uh, software like uh, Lightroom, Photoshop and uh, other tools for embedding metadata. Okay, and we are also in heavy uh, strict contact with, uh, with the users and there we know that many of them take the photo as a raw, in the raw format. And then they copy the file in, onto their computer and then they launch Lightroom and maybe they modify a little bit the image and then they create the JPEG. Actually, the more or less original JPEG because this is the one which is in use for publishing. So put into the supply cha chain. So what are the thoughts about that? So the uh, original JPEG is not created in the camera as it was an assumption in many of the presentations, but in a step further on. So since this is the as to the JPEG committee in general <clears throat> or the ATL group, I, I can I can maybe give you a quick, a quick answer and leave uh, that to the coaches also to complement. Well, it, it's an excellent question. As you know, um, JPEG has not offered any any raw format uh, companies that, that do cameras, they each have their own 
I believe that there is uh, also DNG. I don't know if it's the international standard, but it's 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 something that is like a standard uh, that uh, that is used, but to some extent, not always. Uh, and uh, so so it's a, it's a good question. I don't. Uh, I think that at this moment we really didn't think about it. Uh, so for us, uh, it was not necessarily JPEG, but all the JPEG formats, right? So so it's. Uh, not all images are in JPEG. Uh, there are some in JPEG 2000. There are things that are in JPEG XS, and currently JPEG XL is picking up. So, so this is this is where the the this this information was supposed to to reside. But that's an excellent question. What about what about something that is outside of the existing formats that JPEG is dealing with, and uh, and what should be done? I don't have an answer. Um, it's a good question. We have to find an answer for it. I don't know if uh, Fernando or or the co-chairs, Frederick or uh, Deepayan, have any anything to add. Oh, I, I think there's actually two sides of it. First of all, with this capturing, you start from a raw file, and typically, indeed, you start to do some color enhancements, uh, denoising, and so on. So there is a whole process, and I think that's part of the information that should be captured somehow within the the final image. Uh, similar to what Leonard has showed in, in the demo. So in this case, you have the original RAW photo that you can still refer to from the JPEG uh, image, and you can trace back all the steps that have been taken to come to the, the, the final uh, published uh, image. That's one side. The other side is um, in terms of what we can standardize, that's basically the framework of how to use all these uh, te technologies in, in, in uh, together with, with the, the standards that we have defined within uh, JPEG. Um, and we don't have much control outside of that. But on the other hand, um, there are standards like, I think Leonard can comment on that, but uh, I know uh, so, so for the content uh, authenticity, authenticity initiative, uh, they have been using JUMF, which is a JPEG standard. But I think, and Leonard, you can confirm if that's correct or not, but they, they have adopted a very similar approach for other type of file formats um, as well. So I, I think that there is indeed a need to, to work broader than, than, than just one uh, subset of, uh, of, of formats. Uh, and even though we cannot control it, it's a natural process. I think that it will partially evolve in that direction. I, I think Leonard can also further um, comment on that. Yeah, just, just to expand on it, I think the, the thing to consider, and, and Michael, great, great question, is, is we need to understand, as you point out, that, that the whole workflow. So, you know, so the JPEG committee is going to say, okay, for example, here's what, how it's going to work on the JPEG side. Here's how we're going to deal with things. Right. And they're going to feed that information because we're leading the pack. You know, and if you look at all the other groups, the raw group isn't looking at this yet. Video groups aren't looking at this yet. So I look to us to, as leaders to push that over to these other groups and say, okay, when when you go from raw to JPEG in, in the workflow that you point out, here's what we need from you. Here's what you need to capture at the raw state to then bring forward into JPEG for us to work with. And I also expect that to go the other way. So for example, when you place your JPEG image into Microsoft Word or InDesign or whatever, you know, you're gonna author a document, what, what the JPEG committee is also gonna say, here's what you guys need to make sure you take out of our JPEGs when you bring it into the document and then take it all the way through into that next step. So, you know, we're at web help. browsers and, and social media sites and whatever. So we've got a great center of the universe type approach. And I think our leading that is a great opportunity. So Leonard, I assume that PDF is already open to integrate this. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, we've done a proof of concept that demonstrates how we can do this with PDF, absolutely. Evidence for, for all uh, uh, certainty. The raw is not not mostly archived. So so when I look at photo agencies, they do not keep the raw. More and more, GPA is also used for the archiving, uh, together with with the digital negative, etc. But the actual raw mm, that is not not really the practice to keep that even. So. 
So as I said, you know, this is a very good question. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, Leonard, for actually providing some, some answer actually to this that that needs of course to be to be discussed and you know concretized in a, in the in the next uh, steps um uh, since we are uh, 7 minutes behind time uh, i i propose we stop here uh but uh please don't hesitate to to ask any other question and create and uh, initiate debates and uh, discussions around any of the issues that we were discussed today or or even if they were not discussed uh, uh, through the ATO group reflector. You probably all know in the, in the announcement, uh, there, is, there is a link to the ATO group. You know how to join and please uh, do use the ATO group email uh, reflector for, for, for discussions. I would like to thank all the speakers and all the uh, attendees uh, for sticking around. And, uh, and uh, this is this is the first but not definitely the last workshop so looking forward to to really using this uh, this these workshops in order to get a better understanding thank you all and i would like to close the workshop at this moment